My name is Carl Smithson, and I'm a bit crazy, but I'm not dumb. I remember on a Sunday morning, um, as often happens uh, in this worship space, you know, you come in and I'm ready to lead worship and there's this guy sitting there that I had not met before. Well, first of all, he walked around looking like Abe Lincoln. And generally, if it's somebody in our community that's either new to the community and somebody knows them or somebody maybe that's come back, there's always somebody here who kind of says, hey, this is so-and-so. He comes here for Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner and... <laughs> This is Carl Smithson. He was a member here years ago. He reads all the time. Like he just, he, he'll go check out like 10 books. I feel like Carl is a man of his word. He's probably read hundreds and hundreds of books. Carl is involved in our community here. He is at almost all of our worship services. We have two worship services at 8.30 and 10.45, and he comes to both of those. The way I remember most about him was that he would challenge me. He has a way of challenging us. He likes he likes watching sports. He wasn't a bashful individual whatsoever. Just really any of our church activities that kind of come up, whether it's preparing food boxes um, or, or, or any other thing that might come up, Carl generally participates. He's a very smart individual. I remember that. I remember having many, many conversations with him. In his heart, he wants to help as much as he can. He strives to help people who are in need. How do you feel about having a movie made about you? Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's been very ego-enhancing. <laughs> My name is Colin Sharan, and aside from being a 16-year-old high school student, I'm also an avid musician, and I have aspirations to be a filmmaker. I find myself nestled here in a small southern Tennessee town called Tullahoma, and you probably don't know much about it, so let me fill you in. Tullahoma is about 75 miles from Music City and about 15 minutes from two of the best-selling whiskey brands in the world, Jack Daniels and George Diggle. Tullahoma played a huge role in the Civil War and in World War II and is home to one of the most important Air Force bases in the world. Oh, and even President Harry Truman visited Tullahoma. Yeah, Harry S. Truman. For such a small town, Tullahoma has made lots of history. But that's enough history for today. Let's get back to the movie. For all of my life, I've been fascinated with stories. Fiction, nonfiction, comedy, poetry, you name it. Whether it was reading stories, watching stories, or even telling stories, a lot of times, it was for entertainment. But now that I'm older, I realize that stories are more than just entertainment. They're life lessons. It hasn't been until recently that I've realized that some of the best stories are real life stories. Stories that are comprised of people's experiences and wisdom. So basically, life is just one big story. And if we share our story with the world, there's no telling what people will learn. I came to fruition with this idea as I was told about a man who goes to my church by a brief summary of his story, and I immediately became intrigued. Now, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but looking back, that story changed my life. And it all started at Trinity Lutheran Church, where I talked to my friend, Carl Smithson, for the first time. Well, I was born August 23rd, 1948, in Nashville, Tennessee, at General Hospital. And I guess just had a normal childhood. Went to Sylvan Park Elementary School in Nashville. Went to the third grade, and that's when we moved to uh, Tullahoma. My father was uh, worked for the state health department. He had a degree in engineering from Vanderbilt. Grandfather who ran a drugstore, he was a pharmacist. Right away, Carl and I shared something in common. We're both Tullahoma Wildcats. Carl went to Tullahoma High School, the school that I currently attend. We didn't have a tennis team then, but I was a tennis champion. I won it for the last two years. Some of the baseball team didn't play, but I was a pitcher. I was in the choir for a year or two in high school and uh, finished in the top 10%. I was on the Echo staff as a sports writer. Graduated in 1966. After high school, Carl went on to Middle Tennessee State University. At MTSU, as to say, I was a double major in history and political science, and I got the award as the outstanding student in political science, and also got an award for a 4.0 in history. 
My mate, I always had dreamed of being a lawyer, but I never made. That's why I'm kind of like an advocate today. An advocate is like a lawyer with a law degree in some ways. So when being a lawyer didn't work out for me, that's when I decided I wanted to be an advocate. Of course, first become a self-advocate. And I've been an advocate for the homeless for, for years. And uh, that's about it. Like many of us, Carl has written many chapters throughout his life, each one of them molding him into the person he is today. One chapter that impacted him greatly is mental illness. Well, I was miserable in high school for the most part. I was already starting to withdraw and isolate myself, become the loner and the outsider. But uh, I was still then didn't have many friends. And I said to myself to suffer from clinical depression. Most of the time, if you find a, uh, a mental patient, you'll find he comes from a dysfunctional family. His, his parents gave him a really hard time. My family, my mother and father did the best they could. He said that he saw an angel and they thought he was nuts. And so they put him in a, you know, institution, a mental health place. And so they gave him shock treatments. Electroshock therapy is when seizures are electrically induced in psychiatric patients to provide some sort of relief from mental disorders. Carl received 10 weeks of treatments, starting in the spring of 1968. He believes that shock treatments are evil and cruel, and not treatments at all, rather a punishment. For many years I didn't take medicine, because I didn't want to lose control. And many times when people take medicine, they'll, they'll get better and they'll stop taking it because they get better because of the side effects. You feel kind of numb to the world sometimes. In 1984, I had an incident. My wife almost died from overdose of pills and alcohol. And so then she finally left me. When she left me, I tried to kill myself. So then I ended up at the state hospital for the second time. And uh, of course, I've been committed to the state hospital three times. But, but being committed to a state hospital is not good. I wouldn't want anybody to be committed to any hospital. Because then you become a mental patient. Once you become a mental patient, that creates all sorts of problems because uh, you get a very negative self image of yourself. So for about the next uh, eight years or so, I was living like a hermit, didn't go anywhere, didn't, say, didn't see anybody, and uh, considered myself like a living dead person. With concerning mental health on the rise in America, it's an issue that does not need to be overlooked. Experts say that in a given year, more than 44 million American adults suffer from a mental health condition. And there's not really one way to tell exactly what is causing these numbers to rise, but studies show that our changing culture and our everyday lifestyles affect our healthy minds. You know, a long time ago, it was really looked down on and not talked about. It was kind of scarce where you didn't see it brought out in the open that much and you didn't really know people who were suffering from mental illness that much, but now it seems like more people have some kind of mental illness. Back 20 years ago, for example, people with mental illnesses were discriminated and mistreated. The social stigma for that time labeled the mentally ill as nobodies, which caused hopelessness for those who suffered. But today, mental illnesses are so common that the issue often goes overlooked. I think people are, are learning that they can get help and it's, it's not um, something to be ashamed about, just to try to get some counseling and medicine and, and some help because you know life is hard life is not easy and, there, and we go through things people leave people die in Carl's case after three incarcerations at the state hospital plus weeks upon weeks of shock treatments and therapy he then made a decision that would add a whole new chapter to his life and then all of a sudden I got energized and uh, felt like God wanted to go to nice one become homeless How would you describe being homeless? Well, it's an experience. It's not, uh, uh, at times it was enjoyable. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait. Did Carl just say homelessness was enjoyable? Let's play that back one more time. At times it was enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, enjoyable. Who would have ever thought that homelessness could be enjoyable? 
We see homelessness everywhere, and we don't really think about it. In my case, I've never really thought about homelessness, let alone knowing someone who has experienced it. But after meeting Carl, I think about it all the time now. One thing I think about often is the definition of homelessness, you know, what it truly means to be homeless. And I think we sometimes misconceive what the issue really is. A lot of people think that homelessness is just not having a home. Well, it's also not having the resources or support to thrive. I became further intrigued by the issue of homelessness, and I wanted to learn more. So I made a trip up to Nashville, Tennessee, to talk to one of Carl's good friends and homeless advocate, Father Charles Strobel. Uh, there, I, I was born in 1943, so that makes me 76. I remember scenes from that personal growing up part of my life that uh, people are surprised to, to hear about. I, I remember men who had horse-drawn wagons and sold vegetable off the back of those wagons, or they sold ice for the ice boxes that people had. So I went to Father Ryan High School, graduated, and went into the seminary. And I was in. I went to Catholic University in Washington D.C. from '65 to '70, and of course that was a time of tremendous social unrest. Uh, there was opposition to the war in Vietnam, there was the problem of civil rights, and there was the issue of poverty in the Poor People's Campaign. I was in involved in all of that while studying to be a priest, but I'm old enough to remember it. And in the remembering of it, I understand that poverty is, is really a very serious issue. Father Strobel spoke about his experiences in a big city like Nashville, but I've also experienced poverty in my own town of less than 20,000 people. So it seems that poverty isn't just a big city problem. It can be seen anywhere in the world. When I grew older and I heard people uh, criticize the poor and saying they're lazy bums, that wasn't my frame of reference at all because I saw people trying to make it and survive uh, despite the lack of resources. Resources are an important thing because it can help anyone in any situation. But if we don't have a sufficient amount of resources, other circumstances may occur. Right now, we'll focus on homelessness. Homelessness is more than just not having a home. It's also not having the resources to provide for yourself and for a livable place to stay. I, I usually say people fall out of homelessness because they don't comply with some systems that are helped, created to help you and me and them. Father Strobel says that there are seven systems that are necessary for humans to participate in. The systems goes as follows. Social, psychological, medical, employment, educational, family, and religion. And if we comply with these systems, we can find enough resources and courage to get out of any situation we're in. This also holds true for the homeless. Think of what you and I are trying to live in. We're living in a world and we depend on these seven systems. Those are what we're living in and participating in and probably don't take it, not enough recognition of how important they are. But if you're homeless and you, and you begin to follow through one of those systems and another one and another one and another one, you end up on the riverbank, hopeless, because none of them are sufficiently strong enough and encouraging enough to help you to, to get out of it. It just goes to show how important these systems are, because ultimately, this is what happened to Carl. He fell from system to system and ended up homeless on the streets of Nashville. First night as a homeless person, like. <laughs> first night, uh, I ended up at the bus station. They moved the bus station now, but back then it was right next to the mission. When I got into the mission, the, the bunks are two to a bunk, upper berth and down berth. I got the down berth, and first thing that happened was somebody urinated on me. <laughs> so I immediately went to the bus station. So the first night at the mission, I spent at the bus station. That doesn't seem like the most encouraging way to begin a new journey. If I were Carl, I would have given up already. But remember, Carl was there because he was called to be there. 
And if Carl would have given up that night, who knows what being homeless in Nashville would look like today. Well, the first time when I was homeless, I walked all over Nashville, and my feet got infected, so I had to go to the downtown health clinic, which was a good clinic for the homeless. And the doctor suggested that I go to the library and sit and get off my feet. They can throw you out of a lot of private places, but the library's public. Since they're public, they, they, they can't throw homeless people out. Back then, you couldn't sleep in there. You had to read a book or something, so you would be there and read a book. And of course, I couldn't finish a book in one day or one afternoon, so I wanted to check out the books, and they wouldn't let me check out the book because I didn't have a permanent address. I didn't think that was very uh, nice either, so I advocated for that. Finally, got to change that so now that uh, homeless people can check out one book at a time, which is, you know, that's all I can read is one book at a time. To get it started, I had to put $500 in the bank for when people would lose books, they'd have uh, a way to reimburse them for it. Rather than being hopeless and expendable, Carl made a change for the homeless. But he didn't stop there. For over a year, in fact, close to a year and a half, they, we, they, the, the Episcopal churches of Nashville would give uh, noon meal lunches on Sundays, but they wouldn't let us use the restrooms, which was, you know, outrageous. But being homeless, you're always looking for somewhere to use a bathroom. So I finally came up with the, the way they got it done. I was, was friends with Frank Ritter. He was the reader advocate for the Tennessee at the time. And he, and he said, well, that's why I have a column about it. So I wrote a column that's really entitled Respecting People. That came out on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and by Sunday the bathrooms were open, so I thought that proved the power of the word. So that made me feel good. I finally got the bathroom open to it. I had a shame on doing the right thing. <laughs> Carl had already made a name for himself, and he was in newspapers everywhere. Oh, and just to reiterate, he did all of this while he was homeless. But still, even after doing all of this, Carl realized that there were very few voices for the homeless. So, to change that, he did the unthinkable. Carl ran for mayor of Nashville. To get a better perspective on what it's like to be a mayor, I paid a visit to Tullahoma City Hall to talk to my mayor, Lane Curley. My name is Lane Curley. I uh, moved to Tullahoma in 1957 when I was two years old. So my father could teach at the new Million Dollar High School. So we've lived here ever since. Got married in 1979. We have two great kids. Mayor Curley has lived in Tullahoma for most of his life, and he's been involved in the community for most of his life, beginning in 1982 when he was first elected alderman. My father used to always say there are five Curleys that live in Tullahoma, and one of these days Lane's going to run for something and only get four votes and never understand whoever never voted for him. The very first time I was 25 years old. The only reason I won is because my parents lived here. <laughs> People were voting for my parents and not for me. I didn't realize that at the time, but they were. My name has been on the ballot 16 times, and I've won 16 times. This is my 17th year. My day is in and out of different community initiatives trying to move Tullahoma forward. During the course of my day as mayor, you know, I float in and out of mayor things to business things to, to community things. And, and as mayor, I put myself out there. I go to hundreds of things every year. Now, I'm very active and engaged in community leadership. Every year, I introduce a different community initiative. Go Green Tullahoma, Get Fit Tullahoma, the Tourism Council, things like that. And I do my very best to rally the community around those different initiatives. I think it's important for the mayor to be accessible and available, but most of all, the mayor needs to be encouraging. Because when the mayor shows up at something, the people involved in that, I think appreciate the fact that the, because the mayor's there, it sort of raises the level of, of the things that they're working on. It's not because Lane Curley is there, it's because the mayor's there, and that's a huge, huge difference. Now that we know a little bit more about what it's like to be a mayor, let's dive into Carl's campaign. But before we do that, one thing that I was curious about was what did people think when they saw a homeless man run for mayor? Well, they thought I was crazy, but I admitted I was crazy. So, they, <laughs> you know, was on, the, on the banner, they had, back then they had two editions. The first edition says, mentally ill candidate speaks. And they thought that maybe that was just a little bit prejudicial. <laughs> so the second time they quoted me, when you quote me, I can't even complain with that. So they said, I may be crazy, but I'm not dumb. You know, to start at the bottom, and to recognize that you are now a legitimate candidate and you are on the ballot. To start from the bottom and be on the ballot, it could be seen by the public as 
comedy that it's it's ridiculous. By running, I put a face on homeless people so that maybe you have a different, people have a different impression of somebody that was homeless. I could speak, I was articulate, could talk, wasn't on drugs, didn't drink, fairly neat. And so that would at least get me people to maybe take a second look at people that were homeless. And maybe they're not all drunks or drug addicts or, or uh, Bowery bums in the streets. When he ran for mayor, I was so happy that he was running for mayor because it was the first time anybody who was uh, homeless declared their candidacy for, to be mayor. In my short research, I did not find any mayoral candidates who were homeless when they ran, except for one, and that was Carl Smithson. I call it the new politics of the spirit. I said I was the expert because I'd been homeless like when the others, they would talk about, uh, you know, getting jobs for people and drug treatment. And I talked about that uh, they needed bathrooms in the downtown area, which they didn't have because it's, it's kind of, it gives people dignity. That gave a different perspective than the other candidates. But other than that, I would have been an advocate for the homeless. I would listen to the homeless and to the poor and try to be their voice. And so that was my purpose in running was to to be a voice for the homeless and for the down and now. Well, when you hear that, you want to come out fighting for him. But they weren't doing it for sympathy, out of sympathy. They were doing it because those issues of justice were strong. He gave credibility to the notion that homeless folks aren't stupid. Carl's campaigning platform got him a lot of recognition. And that's when things started to get legit. Uh, I had my picture on the front page with the other three candidates in the Tennessee on July 16. The reason it was on the front page was that uh, Joe Driscoll, he was the, you may call him the major candidate of the minor candidates. In other words, the two major candidates were Phil Redison and Betty Nixon. And then Joe was the, one of the minor candidates, but the most prominent of the minor candidates. I think he's an insurance agent. But nobody would listen to him. Nobody, he, nobody listens to you when you're a minor candidate. So he got their attention. <laughs> I sent him in the chair. And so they, they took a picture of it, and it's on the front page, and it went across on the wires. A friend of mine uh, cut this out for me. He says, which one do you choose? And if you look at that, you look at that uh, picture of it, the one that looks most mayor was me. I never asked anybody to vote for me because I knew I'm going to win. I didn't get many votes. I only got 103 votes. <laughs> Despite not being elected as mayor of Nashville, Carl still continued to advocate. And after conducting interviews with people who knew about Carl, I recognized that advocacy emerged as a common theme. Carl's role as an advocate proved that advocacy comes in many forms. In fact, most of the people I talk to are an advocate in some way. I think in my role here as pastor, I'm an advocate for others, and it looks different in many circumstances. You know, I've helped people get jobs. I've helped drive folks. By nature, I kind of like to serve and to do a lot of hands-on stuff, but I've had to kind of grow a bit and learn that I need to get other people involved because I can't do it all. I do a lot of work around the church because our property is like an extension. I mean, it's one of the ways we interact with the community and our buildings are always open, but we have three of our nonprofits that the church gives property to and I'm involved in various aspects of those ministries. The daycare center for children at Trinity Senior Care, those that have Alzheimer's and dementia, at Shepherd's House, the homeless shelter, Although Tullahoma has a smaller homeless community than most bigger cities, Shepherd's House still plays a huge role in helping the homeless. I was not involved in this, but we have something called the Shepherd's House in Tullahoma that's supported by many organizations and many churches in Tullahoma. Shepherd's House has actually been here for 20 years. It started in 1999. Our mission is to uh, serve the homeless uh, with respect and dignity. You know, that's, that's where someone on a circumstance beyond their control might find themselves homeless. And so that's where they can go and stay. The residents here take care of the house. They fix their own meals and, and all that. So I'm mainly here to uh, make sure everything runs smoothly. 
individuals that are living there, the adults are mentored, the children are taken to school if there's any children there, and they're encouraged to go find work and uh, maybe finish an education or go back to school, get their GED, whatever the situation is, they'll provide a custom approach to help that individual or that family. Back in 2011 and 12, I was a director back then, and at that time we seen something like 300 help 300 homeless, if not over that, for that year. But we've had to um, cut down on how many people could be in the house just because of the fire marshal. And so uh, this last year of 2018, we saw um, about 187. You can see that Shepherd's House plays a huge role in the small community of Tullahoma. But let's look at a bigger community, Nashville. You can talk about yourself uh, from a professional point of view, having worked a long time trying to help the homeless, and then you can talk about your own personal story. The connection between my personal story and what I'm doing now starts in North Nashville, which was a, an area of town in Nashville that was um, poor. What you would have is on one side of the river, there was this first world city that we call Nashville with the high rises. And on the other side, there were lots of shanties and shacks that people lived in along the riverbank. And the Corps of Engineers got enough opposition to, from community members who, and said, we need to clean all that up because it's an eyesore and it, it's not the way we want our city to be presented. So the Corps of Engineers began to uh, tear down shacks and shanties all along the river back there. Many residents were forced out of their homes, so they ended up at the place of least resistance, Father Strobel's church parking lot. And on that cold winter night, Father Strobel's life was changed forever. I was inside the parsonage or the rectory in a warm room, going to bed and I look out the window and there they are, sleeping out in the cold right underneath my bedroom window. So I did what everybody else, I think, would do. I went down and, and I knew them, and I said, here, you can stay inside the church building, and I'll bring you some food tomorrow. Uh, don't hurt each other and don't burn the building down. But I did think about what I was doing, is, is opening up the church for these folks who were homeless. Had they been down the street, that would have been somebody else's problem. But that night they were under my window and they were my problem. Now, throughout the, the following spring and summer, I realized it's going to be winter again and we'll need another place and we'll need to open up the congregation again. My doing it is, is uh, simple enough. Other places could do it. So I sent a letter to the t Tennessee and inviting people to a meeting and explained the goal of sheltering folks in the congreg area congregation. And um, we decided to do that, and we named it Room in the Inn. And what you see here today is a, a culmination of 34 years of uh, providing shelter in the winter months. But I also said, if I do this tonight, the first night, I may end up doing it doing this for the rest of my life. Well, I'm 76, and, uh, and it seems like I've ended up doing it. Room in the Inn has provided an exceptional program for the homeless. And in their long history, they've seen so many different people on and off the streets. However, some people unfortunately never made it off the streets and made that their last destination. Room in the Inn has a way of honoring these people in remembrance of how brave and good they were. I've always said the crisis of homelessness is the crisis of death. Their life expectancy is anywhere from 48 to 52, where we get maybe 20 years more than they do. And what we have here is a way of honoring those who have died, who never did get off the streets. And there's so many stories for all of them. You will be humbled and brought to tears to hear some of the struggles that they go through. So this is our memorial tree. 
and uh, we want to always remember how good these folks are. It was chilling to hear Father Strobel speak about the memorial tree. In the short time after our interview, he named around 30 people who unfortunately died when they were homeless. And I guarantee he can name every single person on that tree and tell their story. Even after 34 years of service to the homeless, he's seen so many people walk through those doors and he's heard every one of their stories. And it's heartwarming to know that he knew each of them personally. Father Strobel has a heart for these people and that's something that'll never change. We've seen so many different advocates so far, and we've heard a little bit about how they play their role in the community. But what about us? How can we be advocates in the world, especially for the homeless? Ooh, such a big question. I'm going to be biased. I'm, I'm, I'm biased toward people being helped. One of the meanest statements I think a person can make is that they deserve it. They deserve it because they failed to do what they're supposed to do. And you think about that, we're, we're a better people than that. We, that's a cruel way to, to, to describe another human being who's standing on the corner saying, I work for food. Sure, there are those people that are chronically homeless, and there are people that want to be that, that way. They, they want that freedom, but there are also those that have do not have a home. And if they had a home, they would, like, they would like to live just like anybody else would that does not want to be on the street. I'd like to think that if our community got together enough resources and, um, and services, uh, that would give them a lot of hope. And so the more people get involved, the more engaged they are, the better it's going to be. I mean, people don't tear down what they're helping to build up. To start, we as humans need to understand that we are super fortunate to live the lives that we live. The homeless, on the other hand, struggle to live just a simple life. And the first thing we can do to resolve this issue is to change our selfish mindsets about what a person is. Each and every one of us, we've got a desire to probably only care about ourselves because most of us are fairly inward focused. I think sometimes we have some uh mean-spirited attitudes. What I think we're called to do as, as a community is that we are all committed to helping each other and to, to be brothers and sisters to one another. That is, I think, what gets people to become more active as citizens. And homelessness is just one of those things that, that certainly probably gets a different spotlight, but it's no different than what somebody who has, you know, a six-figure job might be going through because they're struggling too, because we're all struggling. And homelessness is just something, just an issue that's, that's different than other issues um, that we're all facing. It's just important to realize that we all have our strengths, we all have our weaknesses, and those that have ch challenges, it's, it's up to us to support them as best we can. I do think that it is easy to dehumanize folks and it's hard because you don't know what to do or that you can do anything because you, you feel powerless to do something because the problem is so immense. One of my expertise in, in political science was public opinion and Walter Lentman defined public opinion as pictures in people's heads. The objective then is to change pictures that people have in, of homeless people to, from being uh, an addict or an alcoholic or a mentally ill person into just being a regular person. And I remember as a kid, as a pastor's kid in Savannah, Georgia, my dad kind of stopping me as I was, we were dealing with somebody who I think they smelled or something and I said something as a kid and my dad just kind of reminded me that that was somebody's mom, that was somebody's daughter. And so at the very least, when we see that person who might be experiencing homelessness to maybe just say to ourselves and remind ourselves of that person's humanity, to remember that somebody's child or mom or dad. When, you, when you're walking on the streets, most of the time when you're homeless, people don't want to look at you. You look them in the, look, try to look them in the eye and they'll, they won't look at you. Carl even states, they don't want people like the homeless to be seen. The homeless are supposed to be invisible. 
But isn't that sad, the way we view people's humanity? I think to fix this, we need to be reminded of one thing. All people are people. Treat people like people. Treat homeless people like people. When I became director, then I, my eyes was totally open, especially when you sit here and you look them eye to eye and you, and you talk to them, you talk to them about everything that's happened uh, in their life and you realize they're just like anyone else. Yes, there are, are plenty of homeless people that are, might be out there that's dangerous. And there are ones out there that lie. And there are some out there that have mental illnesses. But doesn't host society have that even if they have jobs? Even if they have homes? You know, they're in the schools, they're in the workforces. And the only difference is, is they are just without a home. So it seems like the solution is clear. Treat people like people. It's as simple as that. And once we treat the homeless with kindness and respect, then maybe there's hope. Now that's the conversation that, that Carl and I would have. And I said, well, Carl, how do we get that done? He said, vote for me for mayor, we'll get it done. <laughs> I love uh, Carl, and I'm so glad you're doing this. In the past year and a half, I've listened to so many different stories of all different kinds, and they all fit into one big story, and that's Carl's story. When listening to these stories, I learned a lot about homelessness and how to be an advocate. But there's one theme that's been the epitome of this whole story, and that's friendship. Friendship to me means knowing that somebody always has an interest in you, cares for you, loves you. If you have strong friendships in your life, you're, um, you have a much higher chance of being happy. And, and it's so important to have a friend you can depend on. And I, and I think that's one of those characteristics of friends, those folks that, you, that you've got to bond with. Fr friendship is, uh, is something that maybe we, some of us take for granted, but uh, friendships are uh, invaluable to get through life. It's just really important to have someone you can depend on, someone's there when you need them. This reminds me of something that Father Strobel mentioned earlier the seven systems, or the seven things that we should comply with to live life sustainably. Well, I'd like to add an eighth system, friendship. Even though the other seven systems are significant, I think friendship is important too, because friendship is what got Carl off the streets of Nashville, and it also got him out of the weary world he was living in. No man's an island himself, so you have to, have to just build relationships to get out of being homeless. And many times we don't even need programs or clothes or food, but uh, somebody that can pers come personally involved in your life. Like for instance, uh, I talked about that I uh, met with uh, Dr. Ron Check. Ron Check was Carl's psychologist in Nashville for a little over two years. While the two met, an unlikely friendship was formed. And he's the one that told me about relationships. I think uh, he did become more than just a therapist to me, a friend. I saw him about therapy about twice a week for two years. He would, he would meet with me after hours. We would go out and eat, and he bought him a house and fixed it up. I helped him fix it up. He was just a very, very understanding man. You know, when you listen to people talk, eventually you get deep enough and they trust you enough, you're going to, pain, some pain's going to come out. And so when you listen to people, you listen to their pain. So all that pain sometimes can do you in. So in Dr. Ron Check's case, he listened to people all the time, but he eventually committed suicide. And one reason, one reason I know that he did was because he listened to people's pain, and it hurts. It does, it does take courage really to listen to people. So the most important thing that a homeless person needs, in my opinion, is not more programs, but personal relationships among people. Friends helping friends, that's, that's the answer. When I first started this project, I didn't really know how I was going to tell this story. I was 15 years old at the time, and I had no clue how to make a film as involved as this. But here we are. When I first sat down to talk to Carl, I really didn't know what to expect. I figured I was just going to make a film about his life, and that would be it. Well, it didn't quite turn out that way, because this is not the film I envisioned a year ago. As the journey progressed, what had occurred was the beginning of an unlikely friendship. And that was with my friend Carl. What do you want people to know about Carl? Um, he's a very likable person. Um, he's just got a very caring and giving heart and he just wants to help the underdog. And Carl's really made it his mission to be an advocate for the homeless. He really goes out of his way and he goes above and beyond to try to 
do whatever he can to help them, and I think he does a really good job. You know, I remember he was tall, thin, dark-headed. I remember he would attend meetings that I would, would have, and he would always be there to ask questions. One of the first things that struck me about his struggles was that he was not just experiencing these struggles, but he was also trying to interpret them in a way that it becomes a larger message of social concern. I feel like Carl is a man of his word. He's not, he's, he's proved that he's not doing this to get something. My recollection is he would attend city council meetings and speak out on issues important to him. And um, you know, good for him. I, I, don't, I never had a problem with that. I wish more people would attend community meetings and speak out on issues important to them. And that's how we grow. That's how, we're, that's how we make a better community. We challenge ourselves. And if there's one word I would put around Carl, I would say he's a man seeking justice. You know, I've asked him about his past and he just acts like he hasn't done that much, but he really has. Probably one of the nicest things that I remember about uh, Carl is that he always remembered to send me a card on my birthday. And uh, I cherish it. I've always been so pleased whenever I, my birthday comes and I get it. And I say, Carl, he hasn't forgotten. He's changing lives. He's, he's making other people's lives better and getting them out of pain and suffering. And, and he's, a, he's a great friend. Well, when you know him, you know that he, when he meets and, and uh, establishes friendships, he stays with them. I, I'm so happy that you're doing this. We're raising awareness about homelessness, but also demonstrating the power of a, one man, the power of one. Well, he is, he's my uncle, and that's his my kid's great uncle, so they call him Uncle Carl because that's easier than saying Great Uncle Carl, which they should call him Great Uncle Carl because <laughs> he is great. So, I never, never have I heard any wrong thing about Carl. I think I said at the beginning when we started shooting this that one of the things that I want people to know is that it's about friendship, it's about stories, and I think it's about gifts. And there's, there's a sense of friendship that we have with him based upon the stories that he shared. Is there anything you want to say to Carl? Oh, Carl. Um, been a great friend. Thank you. And I love you. I told you in the beginning about my fascination with stories. And I mentioned that some of the best stories are real life stories, comprised of life experiences and wisdom. Well, that's true, because Carl's story taught me a lot. Carl's story taught me to care more about the homeless. Carl's story taught me about bravery, determination, and hope. But most importantly, Carl's story taught me about friendship. Because no matter what age, race, religion, gender you are, we can all be friends with one another. And that reminds me of one last story that Father Strobel shared with me. Picture a man and his son coming in to serve the homeless in their church. And they're coming in with the attitude that they're the haves helping the have-nots. For example, they're bringing casserole because they have something, and they're giving it to those who do not have. When they leave the homeless, the father looks down to his son and says, Now son, you were all worried about your phone, but you need to put it in perspective and look at the people we just left. Now that's a legitimate way of looking at what they're doing, but instead of the haves helping the have-nots, there's a better way of thinking about it. In this case, they're giving and receiving. When the father and son give the homeless casserole, Suddenly the son's phone is not that important anymore, and the father and son are receiving a powerful message about how you should appreciate whatever you do and whatever you have in your life. When Father Strobel told me this story, I understood the words he was saying, 
but I didn't quite understand the message until about an hour after our interview. Father Strobel once said, never underestimate the power of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. There's a statue outside of Room in the Inn of an older man holding a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. As I was admiring the statue, Father Strobel looked over at me and asked, is he giving or is he receiving? And at that moment, it all made sense. Soon after, I realized that the giving and receiving story has been the model for this whole film. I'm giving this tribute to Carl and his life's legacy, and in return, I'm receiving a powerful message of justice, courage, and friendship. I've got a story, you've got a story. So, you listen to me, I listen to you. You can always find something good in a person, so I always look for that good in a person and build on that good. Once you get to know a person, you'll find out that you've got more things in common than you would think. Never give up. Never give up on yourself. Never give up on your friends. Hey Carl, I just want to let you know how much this journey has meant to me. It's evident that you've not only impacted my life, but a countless number of lives as well. I've been extremely lucky in this journey, mainly because of your faith in a teenager to make a whole film about your life. But at the end of the day, it's not the film that matters most. It's our friendship, and I'm very thankful to call you my friend. Now, this may be the end of this film, but this is just the beginning of a new story. So to everyone else in the world, I encourage you to go out and share your story, because you never know how impactful it might be. And if you're ever in doubt about how to start this process, Carl has some simple advice. Let's be friends. <laughs>